up this morning, uh, last day, so I appreciate you coming in and listening to my talk on determining the genomic signatures of sexual selection in primates utilizing sex hormone response element, um, Andrew Anderson from uh, Texas A&M University. So sexual selection acts on the variation of reproductive success, and this can happen <coughs> through uh, both pre- and post-copulatory uh, systems. So pre-copulatory is basically when um, individuals are competing for access to mates, and so by different individuals acquiring more mates than others, you get this variation, and a typical example of this would be this gorilla with this large size, it's able to sequester a lot of females, and so there's a lot of selection going on before he even mates. Whereas in post-copulatory, individuals uh, can't really sequester females, so they're um, multi-male, multi-female, so instead they have to rely on out competing their mates after copulation. This is usually shown by having larger testes size, so this vervet monkey, uh, picture didn't come out too clear, but right there, that's not highlighted. Um, so the more variation you have among individuals and their ability to acquire mates or reproduce successfully uh, creates an opportunity for strong sexual selection. And mating system can contribute to this. So I've got my three species up here, I introduced them a little bit, these colors are going to be the same around the top. So monogamous in blue here, uh, these individuals are owl monkeys and you can see they're pretty similar in size and that's because the males either are going to have one or zero mates. And so the variation there is going to be pretty low, so there's not a lot of pre-copulatory selection. They also tend to have small testing sizes simply because nobody else is mating with their mates, so they're not under a lot of competition in that arena as well. Whereas gorilla is gonna be an example of a polygynous species, this is in red. Um, and again, like I was telling you, the males are able to hoard a lot of females, prevent other males from getting to them, so they have a lot of pre-copulatory selection. Usually uh, this occurs as sexual dimorphism, with males taking on big exaggerated traits. And then the vervet monkey down here is an example of a polygynandrous system. So that's multi-male, multi-female. And so males are having a hard time sequestering mates or keeping other males from mating. So again, they devote their resources to these large testing sizes. So we have differential selection in males and females because males are growing large testes. They have these exaggerated traits like these orangutan with this large uh, face flap that the female clearly doesn't have. So we have different phenotypes between males and females. But just because there's phenotypic divergence doesn't mean there's a lot of genomic divergence. In fact, if you were to look at the autosome, males and females would be near indistinguishable uh, in these orangutans. So the main difference usually is attributed to differential expression between the sexes and sex hormones contributing to these expression. So a trait that this orangutan has, the female probably also is encoding for that, but the signal is what's determining which one uh, expresses it. And there are sex-specific signals that indicate that this uh, orangutan is a male, and as a result, he ends up with male traits, and those signals are usually in the form of androgens, and the female signals are usually in the form of estrogens. So where can we find this in the genome? How are these hormones signaling in the genome that this is the trait that should be up or down regulated? And one of the methods is through the hormone response element. This is where the hormones actually end up uh, through a process of receptors binding directly to the genome itself and causing up or down regulation of a particular gene. So this is a cartoon I made, just the androgen enters the cell, binds to the androgen receptor, moves into the nucleus, and then it binds to a specific region of the genome that can affect transcription. And these are called the response elements. So response elements are made up of two half sites. Each half site is between five and eight, eight base pairs long with a spacer between three and five base pairs long. And then adjusting uh, the base pair within the half site can change the receptor's affinity or specificity as the uh, receptors bind to that particular half site. So just by changing a few of these base pairs, I can change which hormone receptor can bind to it. So what I'm interested in is looking at androgens and estrogens. So we would think we could find a signal of the androgen response element in the genome that's indicating that androgen receptors should bind to this region and therefore affect transcription. So how does this all tie back to sexual selection? Well, we know stronger sexual selection in males can lead to more dimorphism, which is an example of pre-copulatory selection, larger testes sizes, which is an example of post-copulatory selection, and sex-biased expression. And when I talk about sex-biased expression, I don't just mean at one sample point in one organ, I'm talking about the uh, organism's entire life. So for example, tooth size is often different between males and females and the males are not constantly expressing tooth-growing genes, so that had to happen during the male's maturation, which is something you might miss in transcriptomics, uh, unless you've sampled at just the right time. 
So sex bias and sex specific genes probably have an androgen response element somewhere in the, in the pathway if it is going to be male dominated uh, trait. So my hypothesis is the stronger selection is on male, uh, stronger sexual selection is on males, there's probably going to be more genes involved, and there also might be a possibility of more response elements controlling those genes to get those male specific signals. So in order to study this, I chose primates as my study group. I chose them because they have multiple social mating systems. You can see we have two occurrences of monogamous, two occurrences of, of polygynous, and then the more common one is polygynous. Uh, they have well-studied pre- and post-copulatory traits throughout the literature. Uh, and an example is this mandrel here. So there's plenty of literature on the body size differences between males and females, two size differences, particularly the uh, maxillary canines and their uh, height as well as their width. Uh, the phylogeny is pretty well resolved, at least for the species I've chosen. And there are plenty of sequence genomes available on NCBI, so I was able to find 17 really good genomes that had more than 85% uh, of, of non-ambiguous base pair faults. So in order to measure sexual selection, I went through the literature, and there's not a lot of direct measures of sexual selection across primates, simply because it's hard to keep up with all the pedigrees and see who's mating more than who. So I'm going to use diverse <coughs> traits as a proxy for sexual selection. So I found three traits for pre which I mentioned to you before. Body mass, canine height, and canine width. Um, and these are basically generated as a log-log plot of male to female using the residuals. So the more differentiation you see, the larger the value. The less differentiation between males and females, the smaller the value. And then I did a post-copulatory. I looked at testes mass through the literature. This is also generated with a log-log plot of <coughs> testes mass size to body mass size. So the larger values indicate larger relative testes size. Smaller values indicate smaller relative testes. Uh, but I also wanted to kind of bring all of these traits together into just one pre-copulatory trait or one post-copulatory trait. So I did a, a principal components analysis using phi tools, adjusting for the phylogeny I showed you before. And as you can see, the first principal component here on the x-axis is mostly loaded by testes size, and it divides out what we would expect. We have the monogamous and the polygynous on the left-hand side, indicating not a lot of post-copulatory selection, and all my polygynous species on the right-hand side indicating uh, post copulatory selection. So, what we were looking for. And then, piece, uh, principal component two largely loads these three pre copulatory traits almost pretty evenly. And you can see again, we create this nice clean split between monogamous and polygynous, like we would expect. And the reason why polygynous kind of has this range is because polygynous species can have post copulatory selection, again, like that mandrel with that huge teeth I showed you before, or less dimorphism, such as chimpanzees. So now I need to find the androgen response elements. So I used Seek and R. Uh, and basically, I looked for 12 AR motifs. I found these motifs in the literature. These were generated by individuals using knockouts. So these are ones that, when uh, researchers removed that sequence, androgen response went way down to the genes in question. So I know that these 12 are controlled by androgens. I also looked for the canonical estrogen response uh, motif and two versions of the steroid response element. Uh, because the second base pair is pretty al is almost even between A and T in which one occurs. Uh, I also generated 15 random um, response elements to just kind of see what random hits would look like throughout uh, this process. And I recorded the number of each one found in each species. So I looked through the whole genome that was available, counted how many times I found each one, and recorded that number. And then I did a generalized least square model, uh, model uh, counting for phylogeny using Fort Pagel and I allowed it to freely estimate lambda. So what I found is a positive trend for some of these motifs. And as we can see here, this is pre-copulatory selection, so that's a combination of tooth size, body size, sorry, two versions of tooth sizes and body size. And so as a reminder, as we go from left to right on the, y, on the x axis, we are increasing in dimorphism. And as we go on the x axis from up, uh, from bottom to top, we are increasing the raw count of response elements found in the genome. So we can see that there is a positive relation there. Then looking at the same motif, uh, we're now looking at testes size. So this is relative testes size. So the larger the testes are compared to the body size, we go up. And then as androgen counts uh, increase, we go up here. And we can see still a positive correlation between those. Now, I did this for over, I think, 31 
total different response element motifs, and this is roughly what it looks like. Now, this is crazy, so I'm gonna orient you to this a little bit. These first four rows are all my pre-copulatory traits. These bottom two rows are my post-copulatory traits, and then each column are those groups I mentioned in that previous slide telling you how each one came out. What I want to draw your attention to is these first two rows on the left. This is the androgen response element and the steroid response element. And we can see that two of the androgen response elements showed correlation for all four of the pre-copulatory uh, measures that I chose and one of the steroid response elements. Now, these are not different ones hitting. This is the same motifs hitting at all four of these. So this is, this is the same three motifs that are starting for all of those. And then in post-copulatory, we can see the steroid response uh, lost its correlation, uh, and one of the androgen response motifs held for testes, and then the second one came back with post cop and I got a random one. You say, okay, well that's all well and good, but in my random ones, you can see when they do hit, it's not consistent across all of those traits. Uh, with one exception being uh, this one right here, where it did hit for testes and for post-copulatory. So in conclusion, some androgen response elements correlate with the opportunity of sexual selection, but not all of them do. And a possible explanation for that is ARAs are actually can be bound by many different types of receptors, including glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and progesterone. So they're all competing. And so because these base pairs can alter specificity and uh, affinity, something might be androgen regulated, but it could be more strongly glucocorticoid regulated. And so you're not going to see that pattern show up as cleanly. Also, sexual selection may not affect all androgen response elements. So some things like sperm production or um, penis growth are something that all males need to have and that does need to be androgen regulated. So you may not see that same pattern going on there. Uh, in conclusion, I think hormone response elements are a potential avenue for the genomic study of sexual selection. And where I plan to go from here is I now know the position of these response elements. All the genomes I showed you are annotated. So now I'm going through and comparing which genes are under control by these response elements, and so I can start doing some investigation to see what happens when the response element shows up, when the response element goes away, or when all the genes share a response element, what their evolutionary trajectory looks like. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank my committee, uh, my lab mates, and my funding sources, as well as where I was able to pull all of my data.